I'd like to do today is give a little bit of an overview of my thoughts on over-the-counter hearing aids, uh, direct-to-consumer products for those with hearing loss. You know, I've spent a lot of my career actually thinking about this topic and developing innovations in this area. Back in 2000, um, I left GN Resound and uh, helped start a company in Silicon Valley whose goal was to develop products for people who, with hearing loss who won't wear hearing aids. So we worked to embed hearing aid technology in mobile phones um, to compensate for hearing loss in streaming music through servers. And finally, we ended up developing what you would today call a hearable back in 2004. Uh, a little bit later, uh, the lab I, I led developed a self-fitting tool for people to adjust their own hearing aids in a very easy to use way. And um, just a few years ago, I found myself um, uh, providing guidance to the FDA, to the FTC, um, to members of Congress uh, around hearing aids and the role of audiology in the hearing loss uh, uh, services. So um, I've been talking a lot about uh, OTC and, and where our field is going. And I often find that I get um, similar questions from a lot of people with respect to OTC. So one, one obvious question is, you know, from everyone, particularly people outside of our field, you know, why aren't hearing aids helping the tens of millions of people who have hearing loss in America? Or why is it that such a large percentage of people with hearing loss don't have hearing aids? Or why are hearing aids so expensive uh, for people who need them? And now with, with OTC imminent in, in the US in terms of being made legal, Will OTC hearing aids replace audiologists fit hearing aids? And this is a concern for people it, it, within the hearing aid industry, both audiologists and hearing aid manufacturers and, and others. And so, you know, my response to all of these questions is really that these are the wrong questions to be asking. They're based on uh, a false premise. It's based on the concept that everyone who has hearing loss or everyone who has difficulty is a candidate for hearing aids. And everyone who has a, a hearing aid who is fit by an audiologist is the candidate for OTC hearing aids. Both of these assumptions are false. So hopefully uh, you'll understand my, my uh, position on this by the end of this brief, brief talk. So what is the right question to be asking here? Well, you know, what are the unmet needs of the different segments of the population of people with hearing loss? So this is critical in terms of understanding what treatments and what solutions are right for what people. This is fundamental in any company that is going to be successful, trying to understand the unmet needs uh, to understand what solutions are needed for them. And then based on those unmet needs, who actually has a need for OTC hearing aids? So that's gonna be how I approach this. You know, what are the unmet needs of the different segments of people who have hearing problems? So if you consider all the people who have auditory dysfunction, you can segment them in, in some very simple ways. You can segment them by whether or not they have a measurable hearing loss by the audiogram. And there are people who have uh, normal audiograms but still have hearing dysfunction. So we do have those two categories. But then you also have two categories and whether or not the person perceives that they have hearing difficulty. So this gives us four different categories here of the population to think about in terms of unmet needs. So let's consider them one by one. This top left one, people who have normal audiograms, they don't perceive that they have a hearing difficulty, yet they have some auditory dysfunction. I'm going to ignore this group because I don't know what solutions they, they need. I don't know how to find them. I don't know how to uh, address them. So let's just ignore that segment of the population. Let's consider the top right here now. So this is a group that has a measurable hearing loss of greater than 25 dB uh, PTA. But if you ask them, they say they don't have any difficulty. <clears throat> so this is a, a challenging group. We know they have a, a hearing loss, a, a traditional sensory neural hearing loss, but they seem to be doing fine. Um, it could be because their lifestyle doesn't uh, produce any auditory demands, they're able to compensate well, they don't notice it. This is gonna be a really challenging population to uh, consider to say that they have any need at all for a hearing aid. OTC or audiolo audi audiology fit hearing aid because they, they don't have a perceived need. Now, maybe you could expose them to devices and get them to understand the need, but that's gonna be a real challenge, marketing challenge. So for the sake of this talk, I'm going to ignore this population as well, because I think they're a really, really difficult group uh, to address. 
And um, I, I, I think we have other opportunities for uh, solutions for people who do have unmet needs today. So now the bottom left here, these are people who have normal audiograms, but uh, are say that they have hearing difficulty. So there's a lot of people who walk into audiology clinics saying they need hearing help, but when you measure their audiogram, it looks normal. And what do you do? You send them away saying your hearing is fine. It's not fine. There's a reason they showed up. I'm going to talk about this group uh, right at the very end because they're not necessarily candidates for hearing aids, but they're candidates for other solutions. Finally, this group in the bottom right. These are people with a measurable hearing loss by the audiogram, and if you ask them, they say they have hearing difficulty. We can split this into two groups, those who accept uh, professional help and those who accept the use of hearing aids as a solution, and then those who, for whatever reason, uh, are, are not seeking any help. They're not wearing devices. They're not going to see professionals. So let's consider these two groups as separate uh, segments. So let's consider this group right here. This is the segment that everyone who's in the field knows and understands really well. So this is the population with a measurable hearing loss and they know they, they, they have hearing problems and they wanna see a professional <clears throat> to get treatment. So what do they want? Well, you know, all of us can list what, what their needs are. This is just a small uh, selection of those. Improved speech understanding, improved sound quality, less listening effort. But, you know, uh, these are all things that hearing aid companies, device manufacturers are producing and developing innovations year by year. What's important in this list this group wants improved care from their professional, whoever they are, audiologist or hearing uh, care practitioner. Uh, this is a critically important for this group. They know they have hearing loss. They know it's a hearing health condition. They want to see a healthcare worker and they want good quality of care from that worker. So we know that this is critical and the level of care is important because there's a lot of data that shows the level of care correlates with the satisfaction with hearing aids. This is out of Sweden where the y-axis shows uh, the amount of care that they got from their audiologist. The x-axis is how satisfied they are with their hearing aid. You see a very strong relationship between the level of care they got and how satisfied they are with their hearing aids months later. At the National Acoustic Laboratories, we also got similar data where three months after their first fitting, we questioned people on how satisfied they were with their hearing aids, how much benefit they were getting, and you see that the, the more benefit they get is highly correlated with the amount of care and the level of interest that they got from their clinician. So if a clinician isn't giving much attention, if they're not giving much care, the benefit they're getting from their hearing aids later on is low. So there's a, there's a, a, a relationship between the audio, audiology, the hearing care professionals services, and the outcomes that people get with their devices. And, and this is just like in any field where you seek professional help, the better the help you get, the more satisfied you are with the outcomes. This really should be no surprise. And so for the population that currently is accepting of going to see a professional, this is really important. So the summary I think with this group is, is hearing care professionals will continue to play a very significant role for this group because for whatever reason, they want professional help uh, and, they, and the, the more they get it, the more satisfied they are with their uh, treatment. Now let's consider this group uh, on the bottom right here, they have an audiogram that shows the hearing loss. They know they have hearing difficulty, but they're not going to see a hearing care professional. So, so what are the unmet needs of this group? Well, there are a couple reports that came out a few years ago that uh, said that the main issues here are accessibility and affordability uh, to, to care, to treatment. So if we look at a, a model of behavior, something that's been applied to uh, healthcare behavior, such as why do people not stick to diets? Why do people smoke? Um, this is a, a very nice framework for understanding what are the reasons why people behave in a certain way. It's called the COMB framework for capability, motivation, opportunity that influences behavior. So if we think about the behavior of not seeking a hearing care professional, when you know you have a hearing problem, what are the reasons behind that? Well, um, accessibility and affordability would fall under opportunity. Now, I would question whether these are really true, because if you go online, you can get a lot of people who will mail you a, hear, a cheap hearing aid uh, to your doorstep tomorrow. So is accessibility and affordability an issue? Let's say it is. Let's put it on the list. But what the framework tells us is there are other, a lot of other considerations to think about in terms of why people are rejecting audiologists. So what might those be? Well, stigma. Uh, people are just lazy. Um, they don't have confidence that the solution is going to help them. Uh, there aren't people around them who are supporting them and telling them to do the right thing. 
um, you know, or they just they just want to do things themselves. They don't want anyone else's help. There's a variety of reasons why people may choose not to get a hearing aid, and these can be defined all under that combi structure. At NAL, we've done a lot of research into what it takes to be successful with self-fitting hearing aids. And I tell you what, it takes a lot of, there are a lot of ways that you can fail in getting someone to be successful with an OTC or a self-fitting hearing aid. We did a study of 60 adults, gave them all hearing aids that were designed to be self-fitting, gave them the instructions and said, okay, let's see how you do. And what we found was only about one in four were able to be successful in fitting themselves. Another half were able to be successful if they had, prof if they had professional uh, help uh, assistance, and then another third just weren't successful at all. So getting someone successful with a hearing aid device is not easy as any professional knows. Market Track 10 recently published earlier this year has a lot of data on attitudes towards hearing care professionals and self-fit devices. Looking at the different tasks that are necessary in order to get to a self-fit device, uh, over 3,000 people who have hearing loss, some with hearing aids, some without, were asked uh, their level of comfort in doing things like selecting the right technology, fitting it themselves, you know, learning how to use the features. And about half the people were comfortable and about half of them were not. So there's a bunch of people out there who say, you know what, I think I can do it myself. But a lot of people are like, you know what, I think I'd rather get some help with this. Uh, when uh, the population was asked whether uh, they would prefer to get uh, uh, over the counter product themselves or go to see a professional uh, if they were to get another hearing aid, those who are current hearing aid owners, almost 90% said, you know what, I'd rather go see a professional. Probably not surprising because they had a good experience. Those who have hearing loss but are not hearing aid owners, about 60%, 56% said, you know, I'll, I would probably look at a hearing care professional, but almost half said, you know what, I think I would give these OTC devices a, a chance and see how they go. So, you know, again, there are different segments of uh, different attitudes towards devices here. When asked, whether uh, people with hearing loss when asked whether they think a professional provides value in terms of your success with the device. Hearing aid owners, 90% said, yes, of course, they provide they provide value. And again, non-hearing aid owners, it was about, you know, 50, 60%, I think it was 66% said, you know, I think a hearing care professional does add value. The other said, you, you know, probably not. I can probably take care of it myself. So again, different segments, different attitudes, and different beliefs that are going to drive different behaviors in terms of whether people seek uh, professional uh, fit devices or not. So if we look at the combi model, there are a variety of reasons why people might choose uh, to go and get an OTC device instead of seeing a professional. If they're socially acceptable, if they get support from others, again, if they're affordable, if they have activities that are being limited because of their hearing, in terms of capability, if they feel that they're able to select the, the proper device, if they're able, if they're capable in terms of fitting themselves and managing any, any apps or technology that goes along with it. And then if they are motivated to, to do so, if they believe that the devices will help them, if they're not concerned about stigma, if it fits their lifestyle and so on. So there's a lot of things that you have to get right in order for OTCs to, to work for someone. And conversely, there's a lot of reasons why people are not going to see professionals. And I think they're really nicely described by the factors uh, in this model. So in summary for this population, there are a lot of challenges to get this population to accept OTC hearing aids. And it's not just accessibility and affordability. There's other things that you need to be successful in order for this population who are rejecting professional care to get them some form of self-help solution. So we'll see how well uh, companies do uh, with that challenge when uh, OTCs become legal within the US. Finally, let's consider this bottom left group here. These are people who have normal audiograms if you measure them uh, you know, with the Houston Westlake procedure, but um, they proclaim that they have hearing difficulty of some sort and, and are looking for solutions. So what are the unmet needs of this group? Well, they, they typically complain about difficulty with speech and noise. Uh, they want uh, a solution that is just dead simple to use. They want something that looks really good because, you know, they uh, they are a very high demanding group. They don't they're not going to stand for any side effects, whether it's occlusion, discomfort, um, other things. And then obviously it has for this group, it has to be reasonably priced. I'm not going to pay thousands of dollars for a solution for this. So there are a lot of products on the market already for this group. 
And you know they they work really well. Um, this was a uh, data from a product that evolved from something that I worked on a long time ago, showing on the bar on the left is the benefit that a traditional hearing aid provides for speech and noise. The middle bar shows the benefit for speech and noise that uh, a hearable can provide, just wearing a hearable on your ear. Uh, and then the far right bar shows the benefit you can get with a remote microphone connected to a hearable. So, you know, they can improve speech and noise. That is without a doubt. You can you can fit them. Uh, they can provide uh, hearing help, but that's not the only uh, need that needs to be met. Otherwise, everyone would be walking around with a hearable. There are over 25 million people, adults in the United States, who fall into that segment of people with a normal audiogram but hearing difficulty, particular speech and noise. So why aren't there 25 million people walking around every day wearing hearables? It's because of those unmet needs. It's not just about putting in good directional microphones for speech understanding improvement. The cosmetics have to be really good. It has to be really easy to use. You can't have occlusion. You can't have discomfort. Um, and it's got to be, you've got to, you've got to hit all of these. And, and I would say so far, not there hasn't been a manufacturer that has done every single one of these uh, features uh, for people. So, and there are other uh, needs as well. If we apply a combi model for this group, other, uh, other factors will surface in the behavior of why someone would choose to wear a hearable or not. So the summary for this group is, it is a very large group out there, underserved. Um, they don't need a hearing aid because they have normal audiograms. They do not need amplification. So hearing aids are not for them but they need a device that can help them with speech and noise. And the challenge is, is really about that usability, the cosmetics, uh, social stigma, making it, uh, making it easy and, and acceptable. And you know, this, I think this is an opportunity for hearing care professionals. I think there are people walking through the doors of clinics every day who have normal audiograms, who, uh, for whom hearing aids are not a solution, but these could help. And you know, I think it's in the best interest of the of the public, uh, the hearing uh, dysfunction public, if professionals worked this into their portfolio of treatment solutions for this segment of the population who have a hearing need, but it's not a traditional one that can be met by traditional hearing aids. So, in summary, when you when you think about OTC hearing aids, if you think about hear, hear, uh, hearables, you think about traditional professionally. Uh, hearing care professionally fit devices and services rehabilitation. You know, it's not one size, it's not one size for everyone. Uh, you have different segments with different needs and you have to understand which segment a person is in order to understand which treatment is appropriate for them. And um, these are very uh, large uh, populations. We're doing well, well with that segment D. Uh, people in segment C and E need our help. There are people trying to develop solutions for them. And, but it's a big opportunity to expand the role of hearing healthcare uh, for people who need it. So uh, that's uh, my thoughts on OTC uh, and hearables and these uh, emerging market segments in a nutshell. Um, my contact info is there if you wanna follow me and um, I'm happy to take any questions if you have any. Mm -hmm.